prayer for understanding that God would give us illumination on his word that, and then he would give us practical application of it so that he would open our mouth and let us bear warmly the glad truth everywhere. I trust that's your, really your prayer and that the reason that you come is so that you might learn and then go out and do, which is what that hymn is about. Tonight is Acts chapter 13, verses 26 and 27. They knew him not, the cost of ignorance. The cost of ignorance. How many people, I wonder, in this world have died because they were ignorant of some very small fact that might otherwise have saved their lives? That they made a small mistake somewhere along the road, and as a result it cost them perhaps a great fortune that they did not know certain details which otherwise might have changed their lives entirely and caused them perhaps to go a different direction. The story is told of the man who had sent a note to the one whom he loved saying that he would come back and marry this one whom he loved and he gave it to a friend to carry for him and the friend stuck it in his coat pocket and then got home and hung the coat up and failed to deliver the message. And so the loved one thought this one had forgotten her and married someone else. The cost of ignorance. The cost of ignorance. They knew him not. Our text tonight, Acts chapter 13, verses 26 and 27, introduced as we saw last week by the fact that John fulfilled his course. He did everything that he was supposed to do, but it didn't reach the people to whom it was sent. There were those who heard John's message. There were those who intellectually knew what was going on. There were those who understood intellectually what John was saying, because from Jerusalem they sent a band of scribes and Levites priests, Pharisees, to question him as to who he was. But Paul tells us in the next few verses, they knew him not. That is, they knew not Christ. You recall last week we saw that there were seven key events that Paul used to bring his Jewish hearers to Christ. Number one, he started with the Exodus, the formation of Israel as a nation. He reminded them of the trial, testing, and law, the test that at first they failed but ultimately passed. He reminded them of victory, the giving of the land. He reminded them of their inheritance, the division of the land. He reminded of them the divine rule that God had established, the judges that degenerated into human rule, the monarchy, Saul being chosen by the people. He focused on the first king chosen by God, that is, King David, and gave a restatement of the promises to Abraham. And then he jumps directly in his sermon in the synagogue from David to Jesus, the covenant promised to Abraham, promised to David, now fulfilled in Christ. Then he backed up and gave a closer look at John the Baptist and at his message. There were a number of very important things that we saw about John's messages, ten in number. John's message was a baptism of repentance. His message is a clear outward show of repentance, which was they would be baptized to show they identified with his message. His message was to Israel, like the seven specific events that Paul mentions in the history that we've just gone over. John called for an exodus, just like Moses led the children of Israel in the exodus. John's call was at the end of time of trial and testing and law. For faith there would be victory, just as Israel experienced victory after crossing the Jordan. For doubt there would be defeat. For faith, there would be an inheritance greater than the real estate which God had guaranteed to them as a nation. For failure, there would be loss of the land that was their inheritance. They would go back to divine rule, theocracy, with Christ as the king. But they chose instead to have human rule as a supreme law of their lives. They would remember the promises of David to the reinstatement of the Abrahamic covenant, which also provided a future salvation for Gentiles. But they rather wanted to be buried in rabbinic Judaism 
Would they understand that John was preaching the fulfillment of the promises in Jesus, or would they reject his testimony and remain in spiritual darkness? And that's the challenge that Paul gives to his listeners as we move into our verses for tonight. What an amazing prophecy is given concerning John the Baptist, and then concerning the people who heard him and did not believe. They knew him not. Let me read you those four verses, the two from last week, the two for tonight, so that you see the flow that Paul is driving at in his sermon here. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, note your audience, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. And then our verses for tonight. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled in condemning him. Gracious Father, as we look into your word tonight, we pray for your blessing to our understanding, that we might know Jesus, that we might know him, not know about him, not have interesting historical facts placed in context, merely so that we can organize our theology, but that we know, might know Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. That we might know him in all of his holiness and glory and purity. That we might know him and what he expects of us, that knowing him would change our lives. Father, we pray for your blessing on your word tonight that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Obviously, the first thing that we see here in verse 26, because Paul has stated it several times during his message, is who his audience is. He's preaching in a synagogue. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham. But he adds a very interesting phrase here. There are also God-fearers among them. Now, who are the God-fearers? He's already listed for us, the men and brethren, the children who are the stock of Abraham. So he's giving us another category of people that are there that day. Gentiles, whom the Holy Ghost had awakened to at least three things. We'll talk about how the Holy Ghost does that in a moment, but... They've been awakened to at least three things here in this text. Number one, they've been awakened to their sinful condition. Number two, they've been awakened to an awareness that the God of Israel was the true God and not their own idols. That's why they're in the synagogue. And number three, they've been awakened to the fact of the wrath of God against those who are not in a right relationship with him. As we've seen in the past, God has given three different lights by which his reality, his existence, and his knowledge may be known. I've preached extensive sermons on this, so I will not but mention it briefly here, but this is the context that Paul's preaching in. Paul is the one who writes about this in details in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. In Romans chapter 1, he writes about the light of creation. The light of creation gives enough light to strike terror to any thinking man, enough light there to condemn, enough light there to bring conviction of sin, that there is an awesome God to whom all men must give an account, but it's not enough light to be saved. You can go out and stand under the stars at night, you can look up at the heavens, you can look through a microscope of the tiny little microscopic creatures that are there, and you can know that there is an awesome God. Oh, men harden their hearts to that. We know that. But the man who comes to it with out ulterior motives of wanting to crush the thought of God so that he can do his own thing, creation 
reveals God. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1. Men have enough light to know there is an awesome God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. A man who stands under the stars and contemplates the vastness of space, eternity, time, this microscopic piece of dust floating through the universe that has life on it. That man realizes there is a God who is an awesome God, a fearsome God, a powerful God, and one to whom he must give account, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It is enough to condemn, but not enough to save. The second light that God has given is the light of conscience. That's Romans chapter 2. Enough light to make men know that he is a guilty sinner. He knows the power of God from chapter 1, the light of creation. He knows his guilt before God by the conscience that God has put into every man, woman, and child born into this world. That he is a guilty sinner, lost, condemned, and under the judgment of this awesome God. But that's still not enough light to be saved. Romans 2, 14 and 15 tell us, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Have you ever argued with yourself inside that, well, you really ought to be able to do this. It's really not that bad. If you're human, you have. You've made excuses for why you go ahead and do something that you know you ought not to do. Did you notice something here? Paul mentions the Gentiles. There are those among the God-fearers who are aware of their guilt before this awesome God. They've got a conscience which they have not yet suppressed, which they have not yet seared, as Peter speaks of it. And then finally, God has given the third light, which is the light of Scripture, Romans chapter 3. There is enough light to know all of those things above, but the full light of knowledge as to what this awesome God requires for salvation is what Romans 3 is all about. All men have the light of creation and the light of conscience, and so among those Gentiles who have not yet heard the gospel, there are those who can be called, as Paul calls them here, God-fearers. Most of these God-fearers have tried to come up with some system of salvation because they know that there is a terrifying Creator God and that they are guilty before Him. Creation and conscience are enough to condemn them. Creation and conscience are enough to convince them that they are lost sinners. But God in His mercy has drawn some of these God-fearers by His irresistible grace into a context where they can hear the third source of light the scriptures. And that's what we see taking place here as Paul preaches in the synagogue. That's what appears to be the case in Acts 13. God gave his special revelation, did you notice? In, Act, in Romans chapter 3, he gave it to the Jews. The Jews have been made stewards of the scripture. And Paul makes a big point of that in Romans chapter 3. The scripture is given to the Jews. And that's why Paul's statement here in verse 27 is so striking. Verse 27 says... For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, now listen to the next phrase, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. It's not enough merely to have the scriptures. We reach the third light that God has given, the light of scriptures. And Paul, as he's preaching here, says, the center of all Jewish knowledge, the center of all the biggest studies in the scriptures is Jerusalem. 
the people of Jerusalem have more access to the scriptures than anywhere else in the world. Let me pause for a moment. The people in the United States have more access to the scriptures than anywhere else in the world at this time. There have been other nations which have had more access to the scriptures at times past. Germany, which rejected the light of scripture and ended in the Holocaust. Great Britain, which has rejected the scripture and become a center of Islam. America, which right now has more access to scripture than anyone else is going the way of the Sodomites, which also Paul deals with in Romans chapter 1. Having the scriptures does not mean we know the scriptures. Paul accuses the Jews at Jerusalem who actually heard Jesus himself preach and teach. The Jews at Jerusalem who actually saw him perform his miracles. The Jewish rulers, whom he mentions in particular here, the Sanhedrin, the top theologians in the Jewish world at the time of not knowing the scriptures. Did they have head knowledge? Yes. Did some of them have the entire Old Testament memorized? Yes. It was not enough because they did not recognize Christ. We read you the verse out of John this morning where Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Yes, they were great theologians. They'd been to seminary. They'd been studying in seminary since they were like 12-year-old boys. But they didn't know the scriptures. In particular, they didn't know the prophets. The Old Testament prophets pointed to both the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. They sort of mushed it all together. They did not make the clear distinctions that they needed to, and sometimes our theologies do the same thing. They don't make the distinctions that the scripture makes. And we criticize the people who make those distinctions. And as a result, we have a false picture of Christ. Paul accused them of not knowing the scriptures. In particular, he accuses them of not knowing the voices of the prophets. Even though they all got their signed award certificates every year that they had read through their Bibles. They didn't know the prophets. Do you know the prophets? Perhaps you know some of the moral teachings of Christ. Perhaps you know the doctrines of the sovereignty of God. Do you know the prophets. Can you list for me all the major prophets of the Old Testament? Can you list for me all the minor prophets of the Old Testament? How about the prophecies of the New Testament? How about prophecies concerning the rapture? How about prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ? Do you know the difference? Can you make the distinction? How about the prophecies concerning the great tribulation that are found in the Old Testament prophets and in the New Testament prophets? How about the prophecies concerning the millennial reign of Christ, both Old Testament and New Testament? Do you know the timelines for these things? These folks thought they knew the scripture, but they did not know the voice of the prophets. That's the specific part of scripture, the specific accusation that Paul makes against the rulers and the leaders in Jerusalem. And the people do. Because when Christ came, they heard him, they saw him, they watched his miracles. They were able to consider what he did and compare it with scripture. And they crucified him. It's a rather serious accusation. You see, Paul has been dealing with the issue of having God's special revelation. But in this case, neither understanding it nor applying it properly. Head knowledge is not enough. 
Romans chapter 2 is where he deals with that. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. These were people who knew it. And are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Oh, we sure could tell a bunch of those Arminians a thing or two, couldn't we? An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. You got it in your head. No question about it. Many of you have been sitting here in church hearing the Bible preached for many years. You can count them back yourself. You've got it down pat, your theology. But have you applied it to life and to the promises of Christ's return, the prophets? Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? How about stealing time from your employer? How about petty theft? Picking up just a few pens, a little rubber band here and there, some paper clips, no big deal. Taking things that aren't yours, just to borrow them for a while. Walking off with some of the church property, and then forgetting to return it. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not have committed adultery, dost thou commit adultery? How about your thoughts? Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know the law. You know what's right. You know what God requires. You know how Jesus applied it. Are you doing it? You see, the Jews of Jerusalem were saturated. That was the heart of theology at Jerusalem. The leaders knew their Bibles. But they didn't know Christ. They knew him not. What was the cost of their ignorance? You say you know Christ. Do you know him? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. How you doing with your love for money? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, that through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? That for the name of God is blasphemed where? Listen to this next phrase. Because it fits what Paul's talking about in Acts 13. He has God-fearers among them. He has Gentiles who have come under the conviction of Romans chapter 1, the light of creation. Who have come under the conviction of their guilty consciences, Romans chapter 2. They have been brought by the grace of God into a synagogue where they can hear the word of God. Listen to what he says here. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Paul develops in detail in Romans 1, 2, and 3 what we only have a synopsis of in Acts chapter 13. But he's included in his audience those Gentiles that God has pulled in who are God-fearers and who know there's a God out there. They know the Jewish God is the right God. They know that they're accountable and they're guilty. And Paul says, to you is this word of salvation brought. These are people who are prepared, ready to hear the good news of Christ. That tells us that reading the Bible or having it read to us, hearing it, is not enough. That tells us that going to seminary is not enough. That tells us that knowing theology is not enough. That tells us that preconceived ideas that are wrong are not enough to even get us past the starting line. That tells us that there is no excuse for not knowing who Jesus is. 
we have the scriptures. Not merely the Old Testament, but we have the Gospels that tell us who the Messiah is by name. We have the New Testament, which guarantees us the truth of that which is to come. We have no excuse for not knowing who Jesus is. That tells us that failing to apply head knowledge to the real world around you merely condemns you. Don't just point to the Jews of Jerusalem or to the Jewish leaders. Apply it to us. That tells us that, the, that going to church is not enough, that reading our Bibles is not enough, that knowing theology is not enough, that having preconceived ideas about God is not enough, that we will also be condemned if we don't really know Him. That is, the Jesus set forth in scriptures, prophetic, prophet, particularly the prophetic scriptures. When you think of Jesus, do you think of Him as a judge? When you think of Jesus, do you think of the Bema Seat of Christ? That's where you're going to show up. Not the great white throne, but at the Bema Seat of Christ. Do you understand that your works will be exposed at that time? Your slothfulness? Your ho-hum, lackadaisical treatment of what God has entrusted to you? Your failure to be here when you should be here? In direct disobedience to the scripture? You're putting God second place, other things in your life coming first. Well, they're good things. Family comes first to us, some of us, and friends come first to some of us, and money comes first to some of us. And after all, some of us are tired, so that comes first on some occasions when we don't show up. Other things come first. Our jobs, perhaps a football game, just every now and then. Do you not know that someday you will stand before Christ as the righteous judge? That's what Paul calls him when he speaks of standing before Christ for his crown. The Lord is the righteous judge who will give me that crown that you will be examined as by fire, which will try every man's work of what sort it is, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. Paul is preaching to a group of people who had the Bible. And he tells them about another group of people, just like them, who not only had the Bible, but were top theologians of their day, and they did not recognize Jesus. They had a Jesus of their own preconception. A Christ that would do what they wanted rather than learning about the Christ of Scripture. That's a serious indictment because they were the repository of the only light that God had given whereby salvation was available. Not through creation, not through conscience, but through Scripture. And they were the center source of its knowledge. Dear people, we in the English-speaking world are the center source of the knowledge of Scripture. What Christ are we preaching, or if we're preaching at all, to those around the world. Apply it to yourself. I try to apply it to myself. Knowing about God is not enough. That we will also be condemned if we don't really know the Jesus set forth in Scripture, particularly the prophetic Scripture. Do you personally and intimately Know him. Let me put it this way. Would you recognize him instantly if he walked into the room in a business suit? Well, you say, I'd recognize him if he came in in that bathrobe and sandals and long hair and a beard. You know, I say, hmm, I wonder if that's Jesus. Would you recognize him if he walked through that door right over there? 
He is present. Suppose he chose to make himself visible to you, but made himself visible in modern attire. Do you know him well enough that you would instantly be drawn to him and know him? What if he walked into the room holding the hand of a couple of children? Children love Jesus. They flocked to him. They recognized him. Suppose he walked through the door over here and there's a small crowd of children around him and he's holding hands with a couple of little children. Would you say, that's Jesus? Suppose you've pulled up at a stoplight and you look across at another car and you see the driver in the other car and he looks at you. If it was Jesus, would you recognize him? Do you know him that well? Would you recognize him if he stood here in the pulpit on Sunday morning as a guest sitting here and he comes up to read the scripture? He did that, you know, in the synagogues where he went. The scripture was handed to him and he read from the prophet Isaiah and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We'll be looking at that passage in just a moment. Would you say that is the Messiah. Do you know him? Not do you know about him. Would you recognize him instantly? Do you know him that well? Now you know that you would recognize any of your friends that you know well. In fact, when we ask that question, would you know Jesus? You'd probably say glibly, sure, I know him. Folks, remember, that is exactly what the Jews at Jerusalem thought because of three reasons. And Paul says, they knew him not. Best theologians of the day, most religious Jews of the day, they knew him not. They knew him not for at least three reasons. Number one, they thought they knew him because they knew the Old Testament and what it said about the coming Messiah. They had the head knowledge down. But they had formulated what they knew into their own system of theology. Number two, they'd say, sure, I know him, because they were eagerly expecting the appearing of Messiah at the correct time in history. As you look back at the ancient writers, you discover that this was a time of messianic expectation because they put together the prophecies in Jeremiah and the prophecies in Daniel. They figured out the details, and the Jews are very great at doing this, all the precise details of everything that's in there, the picky, picky, picky stuff. They knew that they were living in the right time of history. And so, sure, they thought they would know him. They were eagerly expecting the, the Messiah at the correct time in history. But they had already decided on the kind of Messiah that they wanted to appear. And third, they would have said, sure, I'd know him, because they prided themselves in being, quote, the right group of people. They were the chosen people. They were the elect. They were the Jews. They were the ones to whom God had given the promises. But Paul says they did not know him. In fact, they crucified him. If he appeared to us, would you really know him? All three reasons that the Jews thought they would recognize the Messiah are also true of us. Number one, we know both what the Old Testament and the New Testament say about the coming Messiah. But the question is, have we tried to squeeze him, as did the Jews, into their own system of theology? He's got to fit our little box. Number two, just like the Jews were eagerly expecting the appearing of the Messiah at any moment now. Really? Do you know how you prove that you are expecting the return of Christ at any moment? I'll put it as a question. Are we living lives of purity and holiness 
that are required for people who really believe that he could return at any moment. Every man that hath this hope in him does what? Purifieth himself. That's active, what you're doing, not letting it just sort of float and happen. Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Well, people, I don't know how to stress that enough. You hear me preach it often. Don't tune it out. You prove something beyond your theology when you live your theology. You say that you believe that Jesus could come at any moment. You say that you are premillennial, that you are pre-tribulational. That is the distinction of Bible Presbyterians. Do you know how you prove that you really believe that? By the way in which you live. Living a life of holiness. Living a life of purity. Living a life of zealous witness for Christ. Rather than clamming up every time you see your neighbors or your co-workers. Saying no when people tempt you to do that which you know is wrong and saying, because I am a Christian. Not just, well, I don't feel very good about that. Giving a clear testimony for Christ, regardless of what it costs in this world. Yes, we are just like them. We eagerly anticipate the appearing of Messiah at any moment. But are we living lives of purity and holiness that are required for people who really believe that he could return at any moment? In the third way, we're like the Jews also at the first coming of Christ. We pride ourselves in being the right group of people. We reformed people are the chosen ones. We are the elect. We're the ones to whom the promises are given. We're not, we are proudly not like those ignorant Arminians with their ignorant doctrines of free will and loss of salvation. Oh, dear people. Knowing it is not enough. Cramming it into your head in a system that you can spit out of your mouth is not enough. We think that we know the Ten Commandments. We're proud that we are the keepers of the Ten Commandments, which is really a quite ignorant position when you understand that the Ten Commandments are not the rule of life for the Christian. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Galatians 2.16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, the right Christ, not the one that you made up in your head, like the Jews who were looking for him at his first coming. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The message is entitled, They Knew Him Not, The Cost of Ignorance. What is the cost of ignorance? The cost of ignorance is eternal damnation. That's quite a surprise for those who thought they were God's elect, God's chosen people. Those Jews at Jerusalem, those who crucified him. Those who thought they knew their Bibles. Those who had it all systematically organized and put down in big long tomes of writing and passed from rabbi to pupil and rabbi to pupil and rabbi to pupil and got worse and worse and worse and more and more convoluted and twisted and turned until the Messiah that they looked for did not look anything like the Messiah who came. There are many pompous people sitting in Reformed churches today that are going to hell. Are you offended when I say that? Then you're like the people who were offended when Jesus preached the same thing to them in the synagogues. You show your true, tripe, your true stripes. You show your true colors. Luke chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So he's starting off on a good foot, just right after the temptation in the wilderness by Satan. 
He's not doing it in the flesh. It's in the power of the Spirit. It says so. He has fame going in front of him. People are looking for him. He is a, a much wanted speaker. He's glorified of all. And he teaches in the synagogues. Right place to be. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah the prophet. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where he stops. It goes on, that passage goes on and talks about the Messiah and judgment to coming. But that's later. That's at his second coming. What he's preaching to them is the acceptable year of the Lord. The timing was right. They'd gotten it right. This is the right time for the Messiah to show up. They had all of their dates together, unlike Harold Camping. They knew that Christ was about to come. And then he closed the book, it says, he gave it to the minister and he sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. They knew the scriptures, they'd heard it read every Sabbath day. Here's a prophet they thought they knew the prophets. Jesus says to them, okay, I'll tell you clearly, this day is this particular scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Ah, false premise number one. Jesus preached some other things in there. That's what that's implying to us before we get to the next thing that happens. Oh, how I wish we had heard the rest of his sermon before he got to that point, because it says, they bear witness of the gracious words that he said. They didn't just say, wow, that was a cool sentence. They were impressed by what he was preaching to them. But after they make their false premise of verse 22, he says in verse 23, and he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, here do also in thy country. The second problem was wrong expectations. First premise was wrong that they thought this was Joseph's son. Second was a wrong expectation. We want to see miracles. We don't want you. We want a show. A lot of Christians in churches today, that's the reason they go to church. That's why some ministers actually charge admission to the churches rather than taking up an offering. You have to buy a ticket to get in. Big churches. Wrong expectations. Then he makes reference to prophets. He said... Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And he's going to give them some illustrations from the scriptures they thought they knew so well, but they'd never put it together. He starts with a prophet. He starts with a very famous prophet. I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. They didn't like to hear about prophets who did stuff for those who weren't what they considered the chosen people of God. To rub his point in, he reminds them of another one. He started with Elijah, now he's going to tell them about Elisha. Famous prophets in the history of Israel. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, 
And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And he did not get any farther than that. All he did was tell them what the Bible said. And what did they do? They didn't want to hear it. This wasn't the Messiah that they were looking for. This wasn't the Messiah who had any concern about Gentiles. This wasn't the Messiah that they wanted to remind them that there were some prophets of their own in the Old Testament who cared about somebody besides them. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. That's an angry congregation. A congregation that actually hates the preacher so much they don't want to hear him preach anymore. Ooh. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. See, they had wrong preconceived ideas about the Messiah so that they were not willing to give up, what did it cost them? Romans 1, verse 32, Who, knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What did it cost them? Romans 2, 1 through 3, Thou art therefore inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? We've talked about the three ways in which they thought they were right, and they missed Jesus. And how those same three things are true of us. And we condemn them because they crucified Jesus. But they were the repository of the revelation of God. But they had a Christ of their own making, not a Christ of Scripture. Romans 2, verses 12 and following. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And we've already seen that no flesh shall be justified by the law. But God in his mercy sent us a word of salvation, not by works of righteousness that we have done. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, here we are in Acts 13, back again to our text. And whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. We have the word of salvation. What are we doing with it? Romans 4, 6, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. It is the gospel of grace. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's not the works of righteousness which we've done. And of course you know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As we examine our own hearts, are we like the Jews who received that original revelation of God, the scriptures, and we know it intellectually, but we don't really know the prophets. We don't really know the Christ who is preached every time this pulpit is open. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Make us a people who yearn for his appearing. Not a people who live every day. We wake up, we go through the day, we go to bed. We wake up, we go through the day, we go to bed. And every day is just a routine. It's not a wake up with eager expectancy that perhaps today is the day. 
Perhaps the Christ of Scripture will call us home. Or perhaps we'll hear the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What a marvelous process in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We believe it, and it changes us. For every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We make excuses for our crummy thought life. We make excuses for our sloth and laziness and lackadaisical attitudes. For our carelessness about the holy things of God that have been entrusted to our care. For it is not ours, it is a stewardship. Father, make us a people who are aware of the imminent return of Christ. And cause us to recognize him with joy and with gladness, not as the foolish virgins whose oil ran out of their lamps, who were not ready when the bridegroom came. Make us a people who are prepared to meet our God. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number one or 449, Wonderful Grace.